Welcome back, children of the night, to Blood and Surf, a Vampire the Masquerade live play podcast. I am your host, Count Vlad von Lestat, drinker of blood, keeper of the Chronicle, and all around the spooky dude. With Ridley and Everett off on their own adventure, Iris Dunn is in search of answers about her ne'er-do-well brother Iggy's connections to the vampire drug drag. But first, she must reunite with Emily and get a new lay of the land. Abandon hope, all ye who listen here. Well, Ridley and Everett have been off uh, making new cab driver friends, uh, meeting uh, old allies, and possibly creating new enemies. Iris, you have found a new home. Uh, as always, uh, Emily has pulled through, and while uh, Everett and Ridley go off to to deal with other matters, um, you are heading to uh, your new home base. Uh, you've got a new lease on Unlife, uh, based on the uh, helpful uh, flesh crafting of some of um, Azaria Tyrell's compatriots. Uh, you've been cleared of the murder of Gordon Stevenson, and are, are free to rejoin society as as your your uh, illustrious poet self. Um, that said, uh, you're coming off a harrowing few days um, with the assault on Montreal. Uh, you hulked out a couple times. You may have killed Everett's friend, the cop. Uh, you, you know, you, you've been up to some shit. Um, but more importantly, you almost got killed a bunch of times. <laughs> and between uh, the, the Inquisition and everything else, uh, it's been a, a bit of a hairy few days. Which is why um, when your Uber pulls up um, outside a beautiful uh, detached duplex um, in the very ritzy neighborhood of uh, Plateau Mont Royal, uh, one of the nicest places to live, right on the uh, the edge of the, the famous mount itself, um, uh, Emily um, breaks into a broad grin uh, and you can see tears in her eyes uh, as she sprints up to you as you you step out of the uber um and she actually leaps at you and uh to the surprise of both of you uh kisses you full on on the mouth how do you respond uh i mean i i'm frozen for a second as anyone would be yeah she she immediately like it's one of those cinematic moments where she opens her eyes and uh, like imme- realizes what she's just done and immediately kind of like pushes off of you with her one arm uh, and just says, I am so sorry. That was very unprofessional. And uh, yeah, I'm just very happy to see you. I'm glad you're not dead. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's never talk about that again. Okay. (laughs) I say, okay. And just to make sure she knows that it's totally okay. I give her like a quick peck on, on the lips. Um, And uh, she blushes hard. Like it is, it is full red. And uh, she just uh, kind of nods and says, um, hmm, okay then. Uh, well, welcome home, welcome home. And immediately snaps into like full on assistant <laughs> mode. Um, she uh, ushers you into um, a beautiful, uh, beautiful duplex. Um, the nice thing is with the amount of money you've got at your disposal and kind of your profile, uh, much like a lot of sort of rich and famous people, a lot of doors open for you. And the chance to have the illustrious Iris Dunn living in this this upscale neighborhood is a real feather in their cap, particularly with your additional notoriety of late. Um, For a hot second, as you you stand there kind of in the the dusk, um, sort of early moonlight, you just remember how fucking nice it is to to step back into your old world briefly. Uh, you've done a lot of murder. You've fought a bunch of monsters. You've communed with a demon a few times. Uh, for a hot second, it's just real nice to remember what it was like to just be kind of a rich, famous person. Yeah. Uh, although admittedly, not unlike most homecomings, it feels very shallow based on everything else you've just been doing. <laughs> um, nevertheless, uh, it you... doesn't have the same excitement. No, not at all. And also it just, it, it seems quaint by comparison. Uh, after particularly after Elysium and seeing like, you know, famous, rich people from and powerful people from throughout the centuries, uh, you know, flexing by buying expensive real estate seems uh, seems somewhat quaint. In any case, um, Emily uh, welcomes you in um, and uh, it is gorgeous in here. It's super nice. Uh, she gives you a quick tour. 
Uh, very sleek, very modern, um, similar to your previous uh, sort of um, loft uh, condo. Um, she kind of went with a minimalist design in order to just kind of knowing how little you'd actually be here. Um, just kind of a very functional, almost like a, like a really nice Airbnb vibe. Like everything's just very functional and sleek. Also, she had to put all this together while Montreal was on lockdown after a right. major quote, quote, terrorist attack. Um, so and it's gotta be all replaceable stuff. Cause if shit goes down again, <laughs> that's kind of the idea. It's also all, you notice very easy to clean. Like a lot of yeah. surfaces <laughs> that are very, like there's no carpets yeah. uh, to be seen. <laughs> um, and, uh, Emily is kind of giving you the tour. Um, she's like, uh, uh, I made sure to get an extra large fridge so that you'd have plenty of room to store uh, your beverages. Um, snacks. Snacks, yes. Um, uh, now, obviously, we haven't been able to install anything yet. Uh, contractors aren't allowed uh, to add anything to buildings right now because of, you know, the citywide lockdown, uh, which, again, I'm very glad you survived. But um, soundproofing will be coming sometime next week, and we'll be working on creating a proper uh, snack room Um uh, one kind of in a pantry off of the kitchen and one in the basement for you. Um, oh. So that if you do need to keep any uh, fresh snacks on hand, uh, you'll be able to do so somewhat uh, more easily. That's amazing. Emily, uh, you always think of everything. Well, after we both turned into like spooky monster voice people, um, it just occurred to me that we might be kind of loud sometimes. So yeah. I thought some sound free. That's why I went with the detached. And I feel um, like we're kind of leaning, leaning into this now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have some thoughts on that, actually. Uh, and there's some stuff I should probably tell you about what that means for me. Um, but we can get to that soon. Uh, now, I understand, Iris, that you, uh, your main goal right now is, is to determine uh, the whereabouts of Iggy, uh, mm -hmm. which I know is, is contrary to our usual stay as far away from Iggy as possible deal. Well, he seems to be the center of everything that uh, keeps throwing wrenches in my plans. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, I've done some work on that. Uh, so we'll definitely get to that in a sec. And then um, we should talk about, uh, you know, um, what leaning in really means, because I think there's some stuff you should know and some people you should meet. But first things first, let's talk about Iggy, uh, at which point uh, your phone rings, which is strange because no one has your number. <laughs> yeah. Um, I answer it, I guess, or I give uh, it to em I give it to Emily to answer. Sure, uh, and she looks very confused because people should be calling her, not you. Yeah, exactly. Um, she puts it on speaker and just using her her one arm, she kind of holds it up. Uh, to d d she does that dumb thing that everyone does when speaker phones are on, where you just kind of hold it. <laughs> you hold it in, in the middle in the vicinity, of you. like like you're a fucking <laughs> Grecian statue holding up a like, little <laughs> bowl. Um, and uh, on uh, on the other end, you hear. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, Miss Iris Dunn. Uh, y'all, y'all there. I can hear a bit of an echo. My, my own speakerphone. Yeah, you are. Uh, all right. Are you, are you Iris Dunn? Um, who's asking? All right. Look, I, I'll just save us a little bit of time here. <laughs> I know it's your phone. Uh, so uh, unless uh, someone has stolen it, which will be a different conversation altogether, I, I'm just going to go ahead and assume uh, that this is uh, Iris Dunn. Uh, would would uh, your assistant Emily be the other person in the room with you there? Who are you? Right. I, I'm sorry. You'll have to forgive my, my manners. Uh, paranoia serves a gentleman such as myself rather well. Uh, listen, Miss Dunn, I'm happy to give you some answers on that, but I'm going to need to know right quick. Uh, is uh, Mr. Uh, Ridley Beef or uh, Everett Fry there with you? I don't see why that's relevant to you having a conversation with me. Uh, because, ma'am, I, I have some information about them for you that uh, is not for their ears. So if they are there, uh, I would kindly ask you to uh, let me know, or there will be a rather serious ramifications, I'm afraid. At this point, uh, Emily is, like, just shaking, <laughs> like, so mad. This is exact, like, she hates, like, the threats are one thing, but the fact that this is going directly to you is just driving her nuts. Um, No, they're not here. All right. That's great. That's great. That's good to hear. All right. Uh, I'll cut right to it then. Uh, Ms. Dunn, I do apologize uh, for the, uh, the, the the small amount of uh, subterfuge on my part. Uh, my name is uh, Marshall Cooper Board, uh, and uh, I am, uh, uh, you may have seen me on the news, and you can hear there's definitely like, 
if, if if you were in the room with this guy, he would clearly be like rocking back and forth on his shoot, like in his boots, like very pleased with himself. Like it's one of those like, oh, you know, I'm just casually dropping that I'm famous. Yeah, he, he sounds like a weasel. Um, I mean, you're not wrong. Uh, was, uh, <laughs> uh, I am uh, one of uh, many people uh, who has been tasked with uh, uh, tracking down uh, the uh, the horrible, horrible uh, uh, monsters who who have uh, laid siege to our our fair town. Uh, I mean, I guess it's it's more your fair town than mine. You may have guessed from my accent. I am uh, not a, a native Quebecois, or uh, as I believe they say. Uh, listen. Uh, I'm part of a joint task force that's up here uh, doing some investigative work to, to uh, root out the actual cause of this. Now, you've probably seen there's a bunch of organizations all around the world, all taking credit for it. And uh, pardon my French, man, but that's a load of bullshit. The uh, monsters were, in fact, responsible for this, but uh, not the kind you might think. Uh, Miss Dunn, I have reason to believe that the, uh, the men that you've recently uh, become acquainted with... Uh, don't know if they're part of some uh, artsy fartsy project of yours or uh, what, but uh, the two gentlemen I have named, they are uh, on a certain list uh, that uh, we're putting together of, uh, well, there's no delicate way to put this, ma'am. Uh, we believe them to be uh, legitimate monsters, uh, you see. Tell me, Miss Dunn, do you believe in vampires? What are you trying to tell me? I mean, I don't know who you are. You somehow find my phone number. You call me on a private number being certain, like incredibly suspicious and like withholding and expect me to just like listen to some bullshit about vampires. Like who the fuck are you? Uh, well, ma'am, I'm the person who found your unlisted phone number uh, and the names of your associates, and uh, I'm currently giving you the benefit of the doubt because I have been assured uh, by several people that uh, you are not involved in this. Uh, but uh, in the off chance you are, uh, I guarantee you, it is within your best interest to, uh, shall we say, cooperate with the powers that be. Uh, I represent some very powerful people, um, and they have a vested interest in preventing these fanged monstrosities from wreaking any more havoc than they already have so miss dunn to tell you what uh it doesn't really matter whether you believe me or believe in vampires because they sure as shit believe in you and uh you hang around those two you'll like be food more than uh, more than not but uh you know if you come in we could have a little conversation uh we, we could keep you safe and help uh help stomp these uh so-called kindred out uh I know this term has a lot of negative connotations, but uh, you asked, uh, who am I to do this? Well, ma'am, I am the fist of the Lord. I represent a group uh, known as the Second Inquisition, and uh, we uh, we got some shit to solve. Now, you can either uh, contact me, uh, come in and tell me what you know, or I'm afraid I'm going to have to add you to my list. And, uh, well, you don't seem to be involved in uh, any of the recent havoc well, let's just say we got a way to connect almost anyone to anything. It's one of the perks of being part of the government. Patriot Act and all that. Ain't it great? Internally, I'm just like <laughs> repeating, ooh, I'm going to eat this son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like every fiber of my being is just. Are you like mouthing this to uh, mouthing this to Emily? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and she's just nodding and like pointing and at, the at the same snack time. Room. Yeah, and I, at the same time, I'm kind of trying to signal her to like trace his number or like do something to figure out who the fuck this guy is. I want to know. I because honestly, the only thing I want is to know more about him than he knows about me because I'm pissed off. Uh, Emily is very awkwardly pushing buttons on the iPhone. There's no way to trace a call off an iPhone, but she's trying to help as best she can. So it seems like she's doing something. <laughs> uh, like, uh, Ma'am, uh, it would seem you are pushing some number keys there. Uh, that's uh, that's not helpful. All right. Well, uh, listen, I'll tell you what. You have to think uh, think about that. Uh, if you want any more information, uh, my uh, my boys are going to send some, uh, some stuff along to you. Uh, don't worry about uh, giving us the address. I'm sure we'll figure it out. Uh, but... Uh, once again, Miss Dunn, I really can't stress this enough. Uh, there are two sides to this war, one that's going to win, one that's going to end up with a stake through its heart. I implore you to choose the right one. Um, do you respond or do you let Emily shut it down? 
I think I let Emily shut it down. I'm an important person. Em- e- Emily should have been the one doing this anyway. Yeah. I think it makes us a, like, if I'm the one to continue dealing with this, at least for me, it's more normal. It's more like human. If my assistant is dealing with this sort of crazy, like, cause yep. honestly in the real world, if I wasn't like, if I wasn't still a vampire, this would be like next level stalkery, mm-hmm. crazy person bullshit that I would just give to Emily anyway. Cool. Can you roll me a subterfuge and composure, please? We're going to see how well in the interactions you've had with the marshal you've managed to... Uh, Sorry, subterfuge and... Uh, subterfuge and uh, composure, composure, please. Composure. Three successes. Um, okay. Yeah. So you've managed to hold hold your composure well enough that it could you could conceivably just be a confused, angry celebrity, which is kind of exactly the play uh, the play for this. Um, Emily uh, nodding and just says, um, "Thank you so much uh, for calling Marshall Board. Um, we will uh, we'll, we'll read your documents. Uh, I'll, I'll have Iris take a look over everything. Uh, but from now on, uh, please come through me. She's a very busy person and doesn't have time to uh, entertain every colorful story." Uh, that comes through her phone. Um, you can have, and she like just gives the address of like the suite she's been staying at um, mm-hmm. for where to send things. Uh, she says, "All right, all right, you you have have yourself a, a lovely day." And then she hits end on the call um, and just mutters like, "You fucking future snack." Um, <laughs> and then she uh, takes the phone to the microwave and just tosses it in and uh, zaps it. And she's like, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, I'll get you a new phone and a new microwave as soon as possible. And she just hands you one of Ridley's burner phones. She's like, I, I feel like he has enough of these. Um, <laughs> so here you go. Um, having dealt with the marshal, um, Iris, where, where's your head at? I mean, obviously, you want to know more about him than he knows about you. Um, yeah. And despite how douchey and how much I want to dismiss him because he's an arrogant man who is clearly religious and kind of is against everything I am. Yeah. Um I still take it seriously because if he's this inquisition inquisition thing sounds like exactly what just nearly killed all of us. So, yeah. Um, can you roll me an insight and let's go with, um, let's go with composure again. And she is rolling. That's two. Two successes? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's hard because you were full of Drac and Metathiax at the time. Um, but uh, you vaguely remember his voice. And basically, like, as he was talking, you just formed a very clear image in your head of, of what this guy looked like. And then you started to realize as the, the more you you kind of fixated on it and with your two successes... Um, you've actually seen this guy before. Um, he was the uh, the guy leading the armored uh, inquisitors out of the uh, sort of like APV that crashed through the wall of Mayday Malone's. Hmm. Um, so, so then how did he not recognize me Hulk out? Because uh, you were already hulked out. Okay. Um, and the lucky thing for you is uh, what happens to you in that form isn't standard kindred stuff. Hmm. Um, kindred aren't supposed to be able to do that, uh, nor does it happen very often. There may be corners of the world where it occurs, but um, it would seem either A, he's trying to play you, or B, um, he didn't recognize you due to your monstrous form. Um, it would be easy if someone was like, that monster is Iris Dunn, to go, oh yeah, I see it. But if you don't have that part of the puzzle, I think it would be very hard to be like, yeah. The, yeah, like, but he already seems suspicious of me, so it feels like it's just he does. Him, so him this luring is, me. This is, again, a, an open question. You don't have enough information on him to really be able to make that call. Yeah. Um, 
but it also does seem to some extent to be a, a future iris problem um because you still have the uh, the orders uh from the prince to deal with um so you kind of log it um emily says she'll she'll start looking into it um but uh when it comes to kind of blowhard from the sounds of things like law enforcement slash military types, that's really more of a, a Ridley Everett investigation than a, than an Emily on Google, but um, she's going to see what she can scare up. Okay. Particularly because he's on the news. So the interesting piece about this guy is he's not operating from the shadows. He is very clearly out. Um, so a uh, bit of a problem, but uh, a problem for future. Um, now, Emily has... Uh, scared up some information on Iggy um, mm-hmm. as, as you, you sort of tasked her with doing um, Iggy Dunn has gone missing, which isn't something that's new to you. This is pretty standard for Iggy. Uh, not, it's not that he like goes off the grid or has any, like, there's no intelligence associated with it. It's just, he'll often like not have a phone and just not be anywhere for a while. Um, however, she has managed to track down uh, the, uh, the apartment that he's been squatting in. Um, so, of her investigation, other than just sightings of him around town. She's been working with Dedrick, who has definitely seen him at a variety of clubs. Um, Dedrick put out like, uh, this guy is a, a bit of a creeper and not someone you necessarily want at a party. So if you see him, like, maybe send me a message so we can get the word out. Like hashtag, you know, Deadheads Unite. And it works really well because if there's anything anyone can get behind on social media, it's just a straight up, like... <laughs> Blame campaign. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, video uh, and photo evidence of, of Iggy, who clearly um, has been been seen around, uh, but uh, he is he is currently missing. Um, Great, love that for us. Yeah, right. Just the best, just the best that that Iggy. But again, I, I think I found some people who might be able to help. In the meantime, um, again, I've got the the address, and uh, our Uber is is standing by. Is there anything you'd want to do in your new new home uh, before you head to Iggy's apartment? Um, I, yeah, I probably shower and put on like, not incognito clothes, but like casual stealth clothes, I guess. Sure. Things um, that are not, things that are outside of the norm for me and like glasses and a hat. And a baseball cap, you know, like the their Kardashian gear when they don't want to be. <laughs> so like leather as, jacket, as baseball obvious. hat, like exactly. kind of the Sarah Connor ponytail out the yeah. back of the hat, uh, sunglasses. Yeah. yeah, all right. Um, the most like conspicuous, inconspicuous. Yeah, exactly. You can put together. Yeah, all right. Fair He's enough. Like, oh, that looks like a celebrity who doesn't want to be noticed as a celebrity. <laughs> yeah, it's been after like trying to get Dunkin' Donuts, and he's just like, please don't look at just, me. Just don't. <laughs> Let me have this. I need it so much. Uh, great. Um, so that you uh, you take the ride over to um, Iggy's place. Um, you arrive in uh, sort of a, a seedier area of downtown Montreal. Um, it's one of those parts that is slowly being gentrified, but still has a bunch of kind of like older clubs and um, sort of like late night. A uh, lot of like, honestly, like you get a little bit nostalgic. because There's a lot of like Mayday Malone style bars. Um, just like kind of rough pubs um, and that sort of thing. Single tier. RIP. TJ. TJ. Um, So uh, this being kind of a a club district, though, uh, to some extent, there is, of course, uh, late night poutine shops uh, all over the place. And uh, it is no surprise to you that uh, Iggy's, uh, the apartment Iggy's been squatting in, is above a truly disgusting uh, looking um, uh, poutine shop uh, called uh, uh, Elliot Trubeau's. And there's a, a rough caricature of Trudeau Sr. eating poutine uh, while flipping off, uh, flipping the bird. Um, it's, uh, it, it, here's the thing. It's probably delicious because it's a hole in the wall poutine place or but it's legitimate at, poison. Yeah, but only at 3 a.m. after... A drunken night. Yeah, wasted at 3 a.m., best poutine you'll ever eat. Any other yeah. time, biological hazard. Yeah. Um, as you walk by the window, you just see, like, a, a big sweaty fella um, uh, in a, a sleeveless shirt with a, a mask on, just, like, stirring, of like, a vat <laughs> of, of meat. Gravy. Uh, meat and gravy. Yeah, it's uh, it's a true sight to be seen. Um, but given that it is the evening, um, there, there are already people kind of waiting on their, their uh, drinking padding, as it were. 
Um, can you go ahead and roll me a rouse check? Uh, we should have done this at the beginning of the session, but it's been a hot sec. Got to make sure you get some hungry dice if you need them. I pass. All right. No hunger for I you. I have one hunger. So. Okay, great. Um, so Unless I took a snack with the apartment, but I didn't. There was uh, no snacks to be had yet. No snackies. Uh, I mean, again, with the, the crackdown, it is very hard to be a vampire <laughs> or like anyone in Montreal uh, right now. Um, so um, Emily kind of leads you up uh, a, a back set of stairs and uh, you're greeted by um, a, uh, a landlord um, who... Uh, who uh, just kind of comes uh, stumbling out and um, uh, Emily kind of raises her hand in greeting and says, uh, oh, uh, yes, Mr. Jerry. Uh, uh, so so good to, to finally meet you. Thank you so much for, for setting this all up. Um, and uh, he, he just kind of nods gruffly and says, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a problem. Honestly, I'm just, uh, just happy we could work something out. This has been a real problem for me. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Thomas. And he extends a hand to you. Thomas or Jerry? But my last name's Jerry. Oh. My, my parents really liked the cartoons. So they named me Thomas. It's a real pain in the ass, but uh, I think your oh. assistant here was just being nice. So you're Thomas Jerry. I'm Thomas Jerry. Yeah. I chase myself around comically for everyone's amusement. And he does like a very exhausted pirouette and then <laughs> does, gives you like kind of disappointed jazz hands. Well, Jerry, you're a gem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your brother is not. Uh, he's been a huge pain in my ass. So uh, I was very happy when uh, when uh, Emily uh, over here uh, said you'd be willing to to settle up the, uh, the the rent he missed this month. Oh yes, absolutely. Great. All right. Well, if you could just you know Venmo that to me or something. Anyway, uh, here we go. Here's the place. It's it's yours now. You're renting it. So uh, in you go. Um, and he opens the door and uh, the apartment just has that stale smell in the air of just like a, a place that has not been cleaned in, in an age. Um, but uh, looking around just at, at, a, at a glance, this is very much a, an Iggy Dunn situation as, as you would remember them. Um, there's just like fast food snacks everywhere. There's an ungodly amount of poutine boxes and, um, as you would expect, there are also needles. Um, he uh, he's clearly been shooting up. Um, there's some evidence of, uh, of like the, those little uh, packets of uh, of drac, like the little vials kicking around. Uh, all of them seem empty, but there are definitely a bunch around. A um, bunch of empty beer cans, soda cans. Um, the place is is a bit of a mess. That said, uh, Thomas Jerry doesn't blink an eye. He just kind of lets you in and, and then fucks off after giving the keys to Emily. Uh, and Emily just kind of uh, whistles and says, "Like, oh, he needs a me, huh? Mm-hmm. This is this is rough. He doesn't deserve a you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, she just like kicks her kicks her heel up, like just softening the the professional beat. Um, what would you like to look for uh, in Iggy's apartment? Um." Probably any scribbled down notes mm. uh, that he might have written about really anything would be yeah. helpful at this point. Um, names and probably just like evidence that he could be alive and that he hasn't like starved or gotten killed. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um Cool. So can you roll me, please, um, an investigation and intelligence? Where is investigate? There, okay. Three successes. Three successes? Okay. Um, so uh, you begin to look around and um, again, it's, it's a bit of a mess. Emily starts helping, but uh, you know that Iggy being this disorganized, the odds of him, even if he left in a hurry and took important documents with him, uh, odds are he left a bunch because nothing was organized enough to just grab a sheaf of papers and go. Uh, as a result, uh, you do find a, a number of, of things. A lot of them are orders. Um, you can tell that uh, he... 
some of the older notes, if there is one thing he's good at, it's bookkeeping um, from kind of money in, money out um, on his uh, his drug operations. Um, you can see that he uh, transitioned um, about a month ago off of um, off of just pushing kind of regular street drugs and onto uh, mostly drac. Um, what's interesting though is his accounting changes um, when it shifts from heroin to and like other such substances to drac in that there seems to be no record of him paying anyone for the drac. Mm. Whereas with the other drugs, he had to kind of pay suppliers and often protection and other things. Um, the timeline syncs up roughly with when you arrived in Montreal. Um, so whether that's a month or a couple months, I forget what our timeline's looking like right now, but it's, it's, it's been a while. Um, but also this doesn't come as much of a surprise to you because Iggy tends to kind of show up wherever you are knowing that if he needs a bailout or a handout, you're generally not willing, but around at least. Yeah. Um, so that tracks, uh, but is, is an interesting piece of the, the puzzle. Um, the other thing you find is uh, at some point um, he took a bunch of notes on uh, stationary from the orphans biker bar. Um, so he has, he's clearly got like a notepad. <laughs> It's like mm-hmm. probably a server's pad from the from the bar, um, and it would seem that uh, some of his um, early dealings were directly with them. That he was in fact buying his drugs from the bikers. So, based on what you found so far, uh, that seems kind of like the the clearest clue as to his whereabouts. Um, you also know that uh, you remember when you were attacked. Um, he, he like ran away from them. So whatever group had him likely wasn't like on side with him. Uh So it would be very, based on what you know of Iggy, it would be very likely that he would fuck off to that bar if he needed protection, because if he knows big tough guys, he's going to go hide with them. And he can't hide with you because he sold to, (laughs) um, yeah. Is there anything else you would like to try and find from, from this apartment? Keeping in mind that now that you have access to it, you could also come back with Ridley and Everett and like really toss the place at a later date. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I have enough knowledge of doing this investigation or what I should be looking for to, to be looking for mm-hmm. it specifically. Totally. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to assume that he, he thinks it's still going to be there and he might show up. So just kind of, Probably tell Emily to put in some hidden cameras mm-hmm. at some point if she can, um, and then make a plan to go to the go to the bar. Okay. Well, um, the good news is that uh, the bar is where uh, you, Ridley, and Everett need to go eventually, anyway, uh, in mm-hmm. order to uh, fulfill your mission for the prince. Um, and uh, you know, as as you you should have known all along, uh, as Iris would would view the world. Um, you know, you your adventures here started with that bar, and of course they were going to loop back around eventually. Uh, the only difference is now you're all a bit more prepared than on day one of being vampires. <laughs> um, so uh, the evening is uh, is is dragging on. Um, I should point out that uh, with with Everton and Ridley, uh, a number of the stuff happened over a span of of days. So I think we're going to say the same thing is true here. Um, you check this out uh, over the, the next couple of days. You um, ah, actually, no, scratch that. Um, so the, the evening's wearing on and uh, Emily is kind of like looking looking out, out the window um, as the, the smell of poutine wafts through the air. Um, and she's like, okay, listen. Um, so it sounds like all roads kind of point to that bar, right? It, it sounds like the, the one place he might go to lay low. Okay. Uh, listen, um, you, uh, you're probably going to need some, some muscle for this, right? Yeah. Cause I know, but- like, I know the, from, from what I understand from, uh, talking to, uh, uh, Mr. Beef, the, the bear boys are kind of out of commission right now. Is that right? That is correct. Um, I kind of ended up having to be the muscle as you know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the end. So, right. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, I think, I think there's um, some people you should meet. Um, Hang on. Uh, Let me just call a car. 
Uh, Emily is uncharacteristically quiet as you you drive through the streets of of Montreal. Uh, she seems to kind of be nervously um, looking at the window, clutching her phone uh, rather carefully. She um, answers uh, kind of your your questions um, in sort of a slightly nervous, still polite, um, sort of short clipped way. Um, but you find yourself uh, driving a, a little ways out of the city um, and uh, sort of into uh, deeper woods. Um, eventually, uh, the car stops uh, literally just on the side of the road. And uh, the driver turns around and uh, she says, really, are, are you sure just, just here? And Emily's like, yep, this is perfect. Thank you. Five stars. Uh, and of course, being a good Uber driver, five stars. Like, great. Done. Fantastic. Mission accomplished. Um with that, um, she gestures for you to get out of the car and uh, you find yourself standing um, on the side of the road late at night uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, sort of a cool breeze blowing um, and a, uh, a sort of a, a newish moon um, sort of uh, up in the sky overhead. Um, and uh, Emily just says, uh, okay, um, I think... Uh, I think it's it's time you you met uh, the people who who saved me. Um, and as she guides you kind of off the the road into the woods, um, you see a bunch of shapes uh, around a, a campfire. There's a couple of cars parked. Um, there's some some music drifting in on the air. Uh, and she kind of like takes your hand to guide you because it's strange that you're wandering through the woods. Um, and as you step out into the clearing, uh, you see just a, a variety of people kind of uh, having drinks, dancing, listening to music. A couple of people are smoking. Um, they all seem to sniff the air as you approach and kind of turn. And uh, with a, a smile, um, Emily says, uh, Iris, I, I want you to meet my pack. At which point uh, a shape lunges forward uh, and knocks you to the ground um, a uh, woman kind of bares her teeth, uh, pinning you to the ground with a hand on your throat. And as Emily literally just like screams, uh, this woman leans down and says, what the fuck are you doing with my mate? This episode of Blood and Syrup features the voices of Ryan LaPlante at the Ryan LaPlante on Twitter, Tyler Hewitt at Tyler underscore Hewitt on Twitter, Megan Miles at Meggie Miles on Twitter, and storyteller Tom McGee at McGee TD on Twitter. This episode's sound was edited and mixed by Laura Hamstra, and all of Dum Dums and Dice's logos are by Decapitated Markers at Decapitated Marker on Twitter, that's M-R-K-R. Our theme songs are What's Really Going On Right Now by Chase Allen Willis and Traffic by Kai angle and all our ads use the tracks no control in chiefs by jazzar that's j-a-h-z-z-a-r all of their music is available on freemusicarchive.org. When it comes to Dum Dums and Dice, you can visit our website at dumdumdice.com. Our Twitter and Instagram are at dumdumdice, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash dumdumdice. We've also got merchandise at redbubble.com slash people slash dumdumdice. And most importantly, you can join our Patreon of Darkness at patreon.com slash dumdumdice. That's D-U-M-B-D-U-M-B-D-I-C-E. Sleep well, children of the night. Ah, 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 spooky. Dum Dums and Dice has to give a special thank you to the supreme beings of our Patreon at this time. Christian Manicola, Long Long, The Half-Blind Prophet, James Quayar, Charles Grams, Christopher Little, Sue One, George Dolby, One True Artistry, Orion Birchfield, Lord Abradovic, Noel Lewis, Scott Garland, Anthony Griffin, Chet Awesome Laser, Jordan Neesmith, Benjamin V, Gavin and Abby McDonald, Taryn Hefner, Cade Peters, Richard Cranium, Christian Mendez, Anna Zed, Fire on Friendly, Logan, Great Dane, and Jill and Noel Laplante. If you want your name to be added to this list, you can join our Patreon too at patreon.com slash dumdumdice. Thanks to them, and a little bit of thanks to you. 